and sex pili and <laughs> capsules outside of the bacterial cell. Um, flagella um, are often found as well. And not all, not all microbes are modal by flagella, but, um, but many have them. And so in this particular example, you can see the, the single polar flagellum. And here's a diagram showing you some different types of distribution. So here's a, a polar monotricious flagellum, so a single hair, essentially. Here's a lophotricious flagellum, mono, um, polar lophotricious flagellum. So again, this is a bunch of these monotricious, you know, bu a bunch of individual filaments like this at the end of this guy. And so again, a whole tuft of them. Amphitricious is where the microbe has flagellum here and flagellum here, one at each pole. And, and obviously the microbe, you know, these don't fight against each other. If one's on and spinning, that'll send the microbe in one direction. And then something, if the, if the microbe encounters something bad, that stops the, um, the flagella that's working and push it. And then the other one will kick in and push the microbe in the other direction. Peritricious is when you have a bunch of um, filaments all around the cell. So the entire periphery of the cell is full of flagella. So again, monotricious, just a single um, polar flagellum. Lophotricious, just a group of polar flagella. And then amphitricious, one on each end. And then peritricious, all around the cell. The flagella ultrastructure is fairly sophisticated, and, and it's a really neat model for understanding um, um, how nanomachines work. And so in this particular case, you've got a gram positive and a gram negative. Um, and so the gram negative, you can tell because it has an outer membrane, peptoglycan layer, here's the big periplasm, and then a plasma membrane. And so this is the, um, ro um, the basal body motor structure. And so again, you see a, the SM ring, the P ring, and the L ring that's embedded in the um, LPS layer. So the P ring and the peptidoglycan layer and the membrane ring, the S and M membrane rings. And so again, here's the hook and then the filament that would go out into the world. And, and again, this thing spins using proton motive force. So protons that are, that are, that are pumped into the periplasm and then come back in will, will cause this guy to spin different directions depending on whether the microbe wants to go towards something or away from something. And I'll show you that in a minute. But here the gram positive, relatively more simple because it just has the SM ring and doesn't have the other other rings, the P or the L ring that you see. So you can you can tell just based on the complexity of the envelope that dictates the complexity of the um, um, basal body motor. So the mechanisms of movement, the flagellum basically rotates like a propeller, as you can imagine, but in, in, it's a, but in microbes in general, a counterclockwise rotation results in a forward run, whereas a clockwise rotation disrupts the run and causes the microbe to tumble or twiddle. And so again, a run would look like this, and then if the microbe wants to wants, you know, you know, decides that it doesn't want to keep going straight, it'll tumble a little bit. And it'll kind of vibrate in place and then go a different direction. And that's what a, you know, again, that's that's the result of constant counterclockwise and clockwise rotational changes. So if you take if you ever for whatever reason take microbial physiology with me, I get into the details of how that happens a little bit better. Anyway, <clears throat> so again, a forward run or a forward run is a result of counterclockwise rotation, a tumble that causes this microbe to kind of vibrate in place and then change directions. And then, um, you know, again, and even with the, even with, if you have peritricious flagella, the, the microbe is still, you know, is still counterclockwise and clockwise rotating its individual flagella, it just has a different effect. And so the bottom line is, well, it has the same effect, but it has a different appearance. <laughs> um, this is just showing you that extra bit of, um, extra bit of uh, motor proteins that are involved. And so here in the, in the previous slide, I just showed you this part, but here I've added the extra motor proteins that are responsible for recognizing the proton motor force. So these protons that slide past these motor proteins cause this thing to spin um, as needed. And so again, here's a lot of different kinds of motor proteins and so forth that allow this to happen. Some microbes that live in the ocean use sodium ions. Not surprisingly, there's abundance of sodium ions in the ocean to, um, to power their flagella. 
some um, type, other types of motility. So spirochetes, like the bacteria that cause Lyme disease or syphilis, these guys exhibit flexing and spinning movements using axial filaments. These are um, um, periplasmic flagella. So they're flagella that actually run through the um, periplasm of the bacteria. Gliding motility usually means that the microbes can um, produce like a like a slick slime that allows them to kind of skate along the surface. Microbes, when they do move, they're, they're following gradients, chemotaxis gradients that, that allow them to go toward or away some chemical, depending on what their chemoreceptors tell them. If the chemoreceptors process it and decide that it's damaging, then the microbe will actually run away from um, a, a chemical. And if, obviously, if it's glucose or something beneficial, you know, the microbes often will run towards it. And so it looks kind of like this, as I'd already previously mentioned. You know, again, if, if the microbe is in a, in a world where there's not really a lot of nutrients or, or anything inhibitory, you know, you, and this is something we would have done in the lab as well to watch this. But in the absence of any kind of gradient, the microbes will kind of run, tumble in place, go a different direction, tumble in place, run, tumble in place, and kind of just wander around without really going anywhere. However, if you, if you put a microbe on one end of a glass slide in a drop of water, and then on the other end of the glass slide in that drop of water, you put some sugar, eventually the sugar would form a concentration gradient across the drop. Then the, if the microbe is over here and perceives that concentration gradient, it would start running. It's still tumbling, and, but, but its, its runs are longer, and so that allows it to go in a certain direction. So again, it's still running and tumbling, as you see here, but the runs are much longer and they're more directed. So that gives the microbe the ability to move in a, in a concerted way. The last concept here is the concept of an endospore that are formed by certain bacteria, not all. They're a dormant form of life, but they, they give the microbe resistance to a, a variety of environmental conditions. So heat, radiation, chemicals, and drying. A lot of soil microbes out there produce these spores because the soil is a really terrible place to live. <laughs> you know, sometimes it dries completely out and so forth. And so if we look at a, these bacteria, they would, um, you know, again, they would, here's a vegetative cell and here's its spore. And so if this cell is, you know, in, in an environment that's becoming drastically terrible, this, this part of the cell, the living part will die but the spore will be deposited into the soil. And as a result, the spore can actually, just like a seed, just like a plant seed, if when the rains come or nutrients come back or some toxic whatever it is, is is eliminated, the spore can germinate back into a new bacterium. So inside this little spore is all the stuff you need to make a whole new bacterium. And this is just showing us some different arrangements. You know, this is if you if you see this guy under the microscope, you know, this is what the botulism bacterium looks like, for example. So if you find this guy in some food, you probably shouldn't eat it. <laughs> you know, it has this tennis racket appearance where the spore is swell is so big it it's it creates this swollen sporangium appearance, but sometimes they're terminal and sometimes they're subterminal. Um, and again, we would have done spore stains, and I'll show you some in the lab section of this class. What makes the spore resistant? Well, there's lots of different layers. For, for one, the layers are made up of calcium and dipicolinic acid. And so that gives them, that gives them um, recalcitrance, makes them strong. The, there's acid-soluble DNA binding proteins inside the spore to protect the DNA in case anything, um, you know, like heat or any of that stuff really um, affects the spore outside. And there's a dehydrated core. So again, it's like astronaut food in there. <laughs> you know, they, there's a lot of um, dehydrated uh, material, so there's not so that's not likely to spoil in any way. And then there's additional coats around the spore that that you know give extra rigidity. And then of course there's some DNA repair enzymes in there. If if anything does happen to damage the DNA, they can try and fix it. And so here's a um, here's a spore that's ruptured. And, is, and the microbe is, is, is germinating outward from the spore. It's a complex, complex process, but, but typically when the spore um, is, was produced, the environment was terrible. 
but then something changed and the environment became hospitable again and the microbe emerges from that. And so the, the transformation process looks like this, where you have activation, where you have activation, and, and um, <clears throat> the, um, um, you know, spore prepares to germinate, and which often results from treatments like heating, you know, just gentle heating, though, nothing like catastrophic, but, but um, you know, if, if, an environment, if, you, if an environment has just a little bit of extra heat, that can stimulate the cell. Um, so that's activation. Then germination, the spore swells and uh, um, again starts to facilitate this process here where the actual bacterium inside the spore can start to rupture out of the spore coat. And then outgrowth happens where the, the actual vegetative cell emerges. And again, that's this picture here of outgrowth. 